Right, hello, welcome. Two o'clock, let's start. I hope you are having a great week. Uh, thank you uh, for the organization for these great, great events. Uh, I mean, it's Friday afternoon. Uh, we are all a bit tired of the weeks. So let's have an easy talk about threads in embedded Linux. So what I would like to, uh, to present you, uh, perhaps some of you have been already uh, doing threads in other programming language, or perhaps in other operating system on some embedded OS. Uh, we have task. And the good news is what you have learned, you can also apply it on Linux. But the Linux landscape is a bit different from what you know. And so it's important even though you can take your map with you, some of the region in your map will be inaccurate. And what I like to do in this talk is to help you to correct your map. Also, some of you may be already uh, be using successfully uh, trade on Linux. For these uh, people, I like to uh, show you some um, internal and perhaps to help you to connect some dots. I'm Loïc Domingue. I welcome you to this talk. So we will have six easy pieces, getting started, thread creation, and life cycle, thread stack, memory access, mutex and condition variable, and threads and signal. Who am I? Well, Loïc Domingue, I'm working with Linux since 1996. Uh, I have a twist for safety critical software. And I'm getting now a bit older, so I thought it's a good idea now to pass the baton to the new generations. So now I'm trainer at Dulas since uh, 2018. Uh, Dulas is a training company that provides great training uh, for about 30 years now in hardware design and verification, as well as embedded software and deep learning. So the question is why Linux, why threads? You see here on the slide some of the system I've been working with. Foundry simulation, telecom carrier grade, air traffic control, airline IT, medical, automotive. What do all these systems have in common? Well, they are either using Linux or Threads, and most of the time both. And Threads should be seen as a programming model. To simplify, um, to simplify the, um, the code when you have different concurrent activity. Particularly in embedded system, we will use thread when we have multiple I.O. We want to handle multiple I.O. that may happen seemingly at the same time. Uh, we may want also to use thread to take advantage of the multi-core. That's the case on Linux. But more importantly, you should be using thread. Between it will make your code easier to understand and to maintain. Now you may say, if you have been doing thread, you say, hey, that's exactly the other way around. It makes things more complicated. Ah, I see there are some confirmation over there. Thank you. <laughs> um, the point of using this programming model is that you will have to have a clear understanding of the timing dependency of the temporal dependency between your activity. So it forces you to get this right. And that's something we want in safety critical system. OK, now let's review what is a thread, uh, what is multi-threaded process on Linux and more generally on POSIX system. So nowadays a process is simply a collection of one or several threads. And all these threads, they are sharing some common resources. Like for example, the memory mapping or the list of, of open file descriptor and so on. Now, a thread is an abstraction, and that contains all the information we need in order to run the code on the CPU. So in particular, you will have thread-specific attribute, 
like a stack. You need to know where you are, in which functions. And then other attributes that you need needed for by the scheduler. So for example, the state, is it running, sleeping, and so on. If you want to have a list of the resources that are shared by the thread, what is common to uh, all thread, what is thread specific, please look at man 7 pthreads to get started. On Linux, there is a one-to-one -one mapping between the Linux system thread and the corresponding uh, task track, the kernel task track. So meaning the Linux kernel only three task, and the scheduler will schedule your thread accordingly. All right? Now I want to just discuss a bit of the details, how it is done on Linux. When we create a thread at application level, we will use a pthread create, which is uh, offered by the C runtime library. And underneath the C runtime library, we'll call the corresponding uh, kernel system call for that. It's the system call is clone. And here you see a simplified view how to call this function. We need a start routine. We need a stack. And there is a bunch of flags that specify what you want to share between the cloner and the new clone you are creating. So of course, pthread create, the POSIX standard, will specify what are the resources to share. But nothing prevents us to create new uh, user space API that would be thread-like, but that would share other resources. And I find it's a very beautiful API uh, that is unfortunately underused on Linux. Of course, that would be a Linux-specific solution, but sometimes you have problems uh, that need specific solution. All right, we have now achieved the first easy piece. Let's move on, thread creation and thread lifecycle. Well, there is an API. Uh, it looks quite straightforward. We need uh, to include an header file. We need to call pthread create. There are four parameters, thread ID, thread attribute, start function, and then we can pass an argument to the start function. OK, that does not look complicated. So here I have main. That's my main thread of execution. At some point, I call pthread create, and then uh, I will have then to trade off execution, the main, and the start function I pass as an argument. Well, it's straightforward. OK, then let's demo that. Uh, let's start with first thread. How hard can it be? Here, I have created a simple program, p create. I have even do uh, some extra, do some error checking, uh, make sure that the thread creation is successful, and then I return zero from main, what I've learned. And of course, uh, we are doing our first thread program, so that must be an hello. Uh, the start function in EOSS, we just print how pra. I'm a thread, and then the name of the thread that is passed as an argument. Well, nothing complicated. Let's compile, go to the target, and let's run the program. Oh, that's strange. We don't see any, uh, any output. What's going on? Perhaps I don't use, I'm not using the API properly and so on. Well, no, everything looks good. So you could look on the internet what's the problem. But you may have also heard the talk on S-Trace. So let's use S-Trace to figure out what's going on. I use the minus F to follow uh, parent and threads. And what we see, ah, we see that our clone function is called as expected. Here we see also the kind of resources that is shared with the clone. Uh, we see that the clone is indeed created. It has a clone ID 575 at the Linux kernel. But then we see someone is calling exit group 0 for whatever reason. And then we see also that uh, the new thread was about to start, but well, everything terminated. So now we need to figure out who is calling exit group zero. Uh, that's not us. We have an exit, uh, but the exit is only in the error case. And we will see here this print statement that we don't. So fortunately, we live in a world of AI, 
And because I am also a, an HAI trainer, I've just had this morning a great AI that will be able to help me to figure out where is the issue. Um, here, I have uh, chosen the muscle library because the code is a bit simpler to understand than Glipsy. But that's, you have exactly the same on Glipsy. Okay, Grep AI, who is calling Exit Group on the muscle library? Let's see if we get, get some answer. Oh, we have now this uh, file Glipsy start main that calling main like that, Exit main RC RV MP. And that's super funny. Because in the elf header file of hello, there is an underscore start function that the entry point, and on ARM it does a branch link to exactly a, a function that is named like that, the, the, double underscore lipc start name. That's a coincidence, right? So here what happens when you process start, there will be a jump to a start routine in the C library to do all the necessary initialization before calling your main function. And the main function of your program is called like that, exit main, blah, blah, blah. So when we return zero from main, we are passing zero to exit. And bad luck, exit is a system call that will terminate the process that is all running threads. And that's why we are not seeing the result. What's the fix? The fix is easy. We should wait. We should join the thread wait to try to finish his business before we return from zero. That's one possible fix. What is the takeaway of this uh, small test? The takeaway is that um, you have certain aspects to watch out when you are coming from some other OS or languages. Uh, for example, on some other languages, when you do something similar like that, no problem. Uh, the system will wait that the trade finish. And there are a few aspects to don't consider. I won't go over it into details now. I created these two tables here uh, that you can look. You have access to the, uh, to the PDF. You can, if you uh, move to uh, Linux Embedded, you can look at this table, the kind of aspect you should be aware of. And that's the table I'm using when I'm doing trade in some other operating system or uh, languages as well. There is one which uh, is dear to me, uh, safety critical. What happens if a thread causes an hardware exception, SEGLI? Will it be only the faulty thread terminated or the whole processes? So here, all thread will die, and that's OK. Uh, it has only an impact how to do the error recovery. <laughs> OK, thread life cycle. Because of the one-to-one -one mapping between the, the system thread and the uh, kernel task, well, that follow exactly the same life cycle as any uh, processes on Linux. Uh, from a programmer point of view, uh, you can adapt a simple version of it uh, with only four state runnable. It's uh, ready to run, but not yet on the CPU. It's running on the CPU. It's sleeping or it, it is exited. That's enough to resonate about your program, and that's also enough to debug it. All right, piece number three, thread stack. That's a super important topic on embedded OS. When we have a small RTOS, uh, when we create a task, we need to specify the stack. And here, the situation we have, uh, that's how we start our thread so far, p thread create, TID null, start routine null. Um, and well, the thread requires a separate stack. And as we have seen, maybe open embedded OS requires to define at least the stack size when we create a new task. And so does the clone API, by the way. Now, I'm not seen yet. And as a matter of fact, that's the second argument. Here, null means you are using the default thread creation attribute. And there is a default stack size. Then, uh, again, with my safety critical twist, I'm interested in what happens if we do a stack overflow. So let's, uh, well, let's have a demo. Let's uh, overflow the stack for fun and teaching. Let's do that. That's the second demo. So here it's a simple demo. I create a stack. 
uh, sorry, I create a thread that will overflow the stack. And before doing that, I will pause uh, before starting the, uh, the, the test, and I will print some information about the stack. And the thread itself is quite easy. Uh, we just have here, we are pausing before we start all the tests. We are creating a, um, um, an array uh, in the stack of one megabyte. And then we are just calling the function recursively forever. OK? So let's uh, demonstrate what will happen. Oops. So here we see the information about the stack. Uh, the, remember, in many of most architecture, the stack grows from higher address to lower address. Uh, we see we have uh, apparently 8 megabytes. Well, that sound seems to be uh, big. Um, also, if you uh, translate the uh, task ID that you get from pre to create to a pointer, it seems to be uh, an address which is uh, located at the top of the stack. Just perhaps a coincidence. And then we have something called a guard size of 4 kilobytes. We will see what it is. So now, 8 megabytes size, that seems super big. And remember, uh, on Linux, the um, allocation, memory allocation is a bit different. Uh, here I'm using the tool called PMAP, where you can see the process mapping of the virtual uh, memory mapping. So if we uh, look at PMAP, here we see that's the stack that has been allocated. I have uh, eight, 8 megabyte plus 4 kilobyte stack allocated at that address, and uh, here, the first four kilobytes here is marked as not readable, and we cannot do anything with it. That's the GUA. What's more important, I think, on this uh, output is are these two numbers here. We are allocating eight megabyte stack size, but that's only the virtual memory address range that we are reserving. Remember, memory allocation on Linux is using a page fold mechanism. It means when you are access one valid uh, address that is not yet mapped, that will be cached by the Linux kernel and it will do the commitment, the physical memory commitment. And that's exactly the second, uh, the third column here. We see we have allocated 8 megabyte virtual memory space, but we are right now using something like 20 kilobyte only. Right, let's run the Let's run the, let's start now for infinite recursion, and then we get a page fault. And that's really a great thing, again, because it means that if we have several stack, uh, several thread, the stack could be stack number one, then you have the stack of the second thread afterwards. We won't be able to uh, smash the stack of another thread. It will crash on Linux. Again, that's great from a safety critical point of view, because we, can, we know there is a problem and we can do error recovery. Right, let's summarize the situations. This is what we have. Uh, at the beginning of the stack, typically, uh, the thread library, the, sorry, the C library, will put some thread control block. That's information uh, for managing the threads. And then your stack grow downwards, and as we have seen, we have a guard here. That's a region of one page, uh, one four kilobyte, that is mapped, but we cannot read it, we cannot access it. So if we try to go past this guard, uh, immediately the MMU will inform the kernel, and then you will get a crash. Some, uh, perhaps, consequences uh, of what we have seen. So first of all, uh, remember, virtual memory range is mapped. That's not physical memory that get committed. Uh, and uh, memory is committed using patch fold mechanism. So if you do real-time application, you may want to look for mlock all. Then uh, the C library. Uh, on embedded system, Linux, we have different C library. It could be glibc, but it could be also muscle. Now the point is, glibc, the default stack size is 8 megabytes, but on muscle it's only 384 kilobytes. So if you need a half megabyte on your application, it will run fine on glibc, it will crash on muscle. So here you need to adjust the uh, stack size. And finally, why do I uh, spoke about the thread control block? 
that's a block of information. That's an implementation detail where it's located, but it has an implication. Namely, if you don't join your thread, or if you don't detach it, uh, this mapping will be retained until you join. Uh, there are API, you can control what you typically control uh, is the stack size. There is an API you can create, a default pthread attribute initialized with the default value and then you have API where you can change the stack size and then pass that to pthread create. Right, let's continue. Piece number four, memory access. Ah. So now we have the, so first of all, what can we access? Because we are sharing the virtual memory space among all the threads, as long as you have a valid memory address, you can access it from all the threads. Now, of course, we want to keep a certain sanity. If in one thread you do a right access, x equal 42, and then later on in another thread, you do a read access for x, and no one in between mess with x, you expect to get to read the value 42, right? So that's the minimum sanity we need. But for that, we need synchronization. Because first of all, uh, you need to make sure that the set occurs before the read for this example. And also, even if it happens in the right order, you have no such a guarantee. Because of modern uh, CPU multiple core, um, because of the, system, the way uh, system is, uh, the cache and so on are done, we need to put some special instruction to make sure that the value is seen. So let's discuss what are the memory visibility rules that are there by default. So first of all, when you set some values uh, before creating a thread. In the new thread, you will see this value. That's guaranteed. Likewise, when you change value in the thread and you join, well, in the thread where you join, you will see what you have changed. That's guaranteed. But that's, what's not guaranteed is what you do in between. So here, between the thread creation and the join, I set the value of t, and then I do in another thread some operation of t. Yeah, I have no guarantee. So you know that uh, compiler can reorder instruction? Well, so, does, uh, so do now modern processor. They can also reorder the instruction. So we need to ensure that something like that do not happen. And one way to ensure that is to use synchronization mechanism offered by Pthread. And we will discuss two of them, mutex and condition variable. So mutex, that's something uh, I'm sure many of you know, that's a classical critical section. You have a shared resource here, that's my T. And what you do, you take a lock, you modify your shared resource, and then you unlock the mutex. And what this lock do, um, it guarantees that uh, either you are doing it or not essentially. So you won't get this problem that you are in between changing some data structure and another thread jump in and also mess around with this data structure and you see an inconsistent value. But the mutex does more than that. What it does here when we unlock in thread A and then we acquire the mutex in thread B, we have also a visibility guarantee of the value. So the mutex will also implement all the necessary memory barrier for you. Um, perhaps some quick facts on mutex for people coming uh, from some other operating system. You may say, oh, well, a mutex, that's really like a binary semaphore. And that's true. But there are a few differences. First of all, it's faster, meaning that you will enter the kernel only if another thread already locked the mutex. Secondly, it's owned by a thread, and that's great, because when a thread lock and someone else has taken the mutex, I can know which is the thread, I can look at the priority, and when we do real-time priority, uh, we can then adjust the priority 
to avoid real time, uh, to avoid priority inversions or to mitigate priority inversions. So that's why it's, that's the major differences compared to a binary semaphore. Now there is a consequence. We have this ownership. It means normally the thread that locks the mutex should be the one that unlocks it. What happens in our situation? You have a thread that locks it, another that unlocks it. Or you have a thread that locks it and locks it twice. That will be depending on the mutex type. So the default mutex on Linux, if you lock twice, you deadlock, for instance. Know that there are other mutex types you can use, for example, error check, that will have all the error checking in place. It's slower, but you will detect this kind of problem, and it's great during debugging session. And mutex does not synchronize which thread lock first. Here, the previous slide, the example worked because this instruction, T here, happened before this one. Now, how do I guarantee that it is exactly in this order? If I reverse the order, uh, well, I don't get the right value. For that, we have something called a condition variable. So that's, again, a synchronization mechanism. And people coming from other operating systems say, oh, yeah, that really sounds like an event flag. I know that already. Great. Let's use it. OK, so the, it works as follows. Uh, what you do is uh, when uh, you, you lock your mutex, here we set the value t. And then what we will do, we will signal the thread that we have set the value t, and then it can go on with uh, its business. And then in the thread where we want to apply here for this uh, change on t, what we do, we lock the mutex. And then we wait with con wait. We wait on the condition. We wait to be signal. OK, now it's safe to continue and change the value of t. And if you are in no uh, event flags, that's the, the, the way you will program these kind of things. Now there is a bug now in this code. Uh, it works fine if it's in the order presented in the slide. But if it happened that thread A run first, then you will never, uh, you will block in con wait. Because there is a rule, when you notify here, if, it's, if there no, nobody is waiting for the condition variable, the notification is lost. And here there is a piece missing. It's called a condition variable. And the idea of a condition variable, you want to wait for a certain condition to happen. So here what's missing is the condition. And here it is. So that's the way you should uh, implement condition variable. Here, what I'm doing in thread B, I say, as long as t is not set, I'm using 0 uh, to indicate that uh, the t uh, variable is not set. As long as t is not set, I will wait to be notified that t is set. And now, no matter in which order, now it will work. So the usage pattern, and I've seen this error many times, so that's why I uh, mention it, um, you have a notifier thread, you will lock the mutex, change your condition, notify the waiters, unlock. And the waiter does as follow, you lock the mutex, you, while you are, do not have the wanted condition, you wait for it, then when you come back from the while loop, you are guaranteed uh, you can then change, do some work and change the condition. Uh, why it works? Because here can't wait. When, uh, when you enter to con wait, it will do two things. It will unlock the mutex and will wait on the condition. And when you are waken up, it will relock the mutex. So here you have always mutex protection. And now you see also why you need a mutex here. Because you check the condition on the waiter thread, and another thread will change the condition. So the mutex guarantees the visibility. Uh, well, there are a few, uh, a few uh, more information uh, about uh, condition variable. Uh, signal will wake up only one thread. Broadcast will wake up all the waiters. Uh, and also use a while loop here. Uh, the while loop is something like uh, when, you are, when you are wake up, you say, OK, it might be the condition I'm interested in, but you recheck it. Again, that's a pattern from safety critical, and that's also what the standards say you should be doing. There is a lot of story about that, but I have no time to tell it now. 
uh, I can, uh, we can discuss that offline. Right, there are other uh, synchronization mechanisms I won't discuss, barrier read while write spin lock. Also know that on the embedded system, we don't want to wait forever. Uh, some of the uh, lock and wait uh, API have also a timed version so that we can have a timeout. Right, piece number six, thread and signal. So a signal traded process, and uh, you want to have a signal handler, how does it work? You have your main execution, there is a signal that arrives, you jump to your signal handler, you do the code in signal handler, you resume, and that's it. Now, thread uh, makes asynchronous code synchronous. So that's somewhat antinomic to signal. And there are other issues that happen. We have only one thread of execution to interrupt. Now we have many thread of execution. Which one should we interrupt? And maybe it will interrupt the one I don't want. So how should I deal with that? So here be some dragon, as we used to say in the whole map. And what I want to do is to meet some dragon with you. I will, uh, so compiling with P-Thread break my single thread code, that will never happen on Linux. But what can happen on Linux, you don't have any threads and you deadlock. And this is what I want to show you now. All right, number, last demo for today. We have uh, here, yes, yeah, so that's a real-time monitor of uh, some uh, breverage consumptions. That's the version 0 0.01, as you see. And uh, here what we do, we have this RT monitor, but we have also a signal handler uh, because uh, the numbers are increasing too fast. Or well, stakeholders have asked, could you implement something like press Ctrl-C and I reset the, the counter so that the value do not go too high. Okay, so I've been doing that. I set the signal handler with seek action. And here is my handler. I just print reset the counter. And well, that's it. Let's demo it. Uh, let's see what happened. RT drink, right? We see this huge number of brevage consumption. And if I press Control C, well, it's great. It's reset. So, well, problem solved. Until, <clears throat> well, if you try hard enough, you will see that there is a, you may encounter one problem. And it can take some time to, uh, to generate the bug, so that's why I prepared a video for it. And that's the video you are seeing now. So here what happened, you press Control C and nothing happened anymore. It seems that the program is stuck. So here what you do in this case, I have opened a new shell and I have started S trace with minus P, I have attached to the RT drink process. Okay, and now we see what well, it seems to be uh, stuck in Futex. Futex is the system code that is used when you lock a mutex and you need to wait. That's very strange. I have no mutex, I have no P thread in my code. Where does it come from? It, it's really weird. So here, mm, I have no idea. And well, perhaps. Let's attach a debugger. I have in the lucky situation. I have a debugger. I could reproduce the problem. And so let's see what's going on. I attach the debugger. And well, it takes some time to get started. And then I will do a backtrace uh, to see where I, am, where I am in the trace. It's a bit slow. Right. OK, backtrace. So what do we see? Ah, we were printing here this. Word consumption, okay, all right. Then what happened, as we were doing this print stuff, the signal handler got called, the signal got received. And then we jump in our handler, and then we have IO puts. So we didn't see puts, but here our print statement do not have any formatted variables, so that's why it's translate to, uh, to puts. And here it seems then we are using a uh, few text weight. Well, that's, uh, of course, uh, that's, that's really uh, how, what's going on here. Uh, fortunately, we have this great tool, uh, grep AI, so perhaps uh, we, we could uh, grep AI. Uh, why does printf daylock in signal handler? Question mark. Well, this is what we get. Well, it seems that there is 
uh, there is a bug in grep AI. Well, it seems there, <laughs> it seems there is a... Um, uh, I fix that now. It thinks there is something called lock file implemented in steadyIO. Well, I won't get that. It doesn't matter. Ah, it's 23. That was the bug. Okay. And if you look at the file, you see that uh, here, uh, it seems that this uh, we are doing something like uh, bah, 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 bah. That's uh, what is managed in the, um, the I.O. And internally, the print statement has some data structure you need to protect in the case you run uh, with, uh, on, on, on multi-threaded code. So what it does, it does a lock, actually. And this is exactly what we are seeing here. So there is a lock implemented. And the problem, you have taken the log in the first statement, your single, single handler has been called, you, you re-enter print and you lock again. You have two twice this lock and you deadlock. And the point is, there is a bug in my code. It's not safe to print, to call printf in single handler. So that's really the bug here. And the bad news is none of the P-thread function, functions are safe to be called in signal handler. So there is a way out of that, and the way is as follows. Is what you will do, before starting any thread, you will block the signal you are interested in with P-thread signals. Now when you do that, when you start the thread, all the thread will block this signal. And then what you do, you create a special thread that will wait synchronously for the signal you are interested in. And then you can do whatever you want. It's a normal thread, and you don't have the mess I showed you before. Right, uh, there is more to say, but I think uh, we have only four minutes left. Um, you have seen a pattern how to uh, handle signal uh, in multi-threaded code. Um, well, there is more to say about signal and processes, uh, but I will skip that for now. Right, if you are interested to go further, there are great books, uh, Man 7 p uh, that's the starting point. Uh, book of Michael Curry's is a really great book. I'm biased because I review it. Uh, this is an old book uh, from David Butenoff, uh, but still uh, relevant. And if you want to learn more about uh, parallel programming, concurrency, threads, and much, much more. There is this uh, really great book from uh, Paul McKinney. It's available online. That's a book that Paul is maintaining since 20 years, updating. It's really a great resource. So I hope you have enjoyed uh, the uh, whole talk. Uh, if you want to come at your booth or visit doulas.com, if you want such a great training like now, uh, visit us. And well, maybe you have any questions. Thank you very much. Question? Yes, there is a question over there. I'm very sorry, I need the mic, otherwise I, I won't uh, understand your question. Uh, what was the, the crap AI? Ah, do you know? Uh, do you know this meme? I will show you what Grey AI is. Yeah, okay, now I get it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that thank you. Cool. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Unfortunately, I've uh, introduced a bug. I didn't test it, it properly. <laughs> All right. Any further questions? Any question online? Yes, there's an online question. Threads.h is included in C since C11. Could we not use these in embedded Linux? 
Oh, that's uh, absolutely correct. Uh, actually, if I remember correctly, uh, on Muscle or on, on Glipsy, it will use underneath p -thread. Yes, that, that's true. That's something I've, I haven't looked uh, to it yet. But correct, that would be, uh, if you want, uh, from the language support, a way to go. Yes. Thank you. Well, I think that's it. Enjoy the show, enjoy the week. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you. <laughs>